these wall panels have to be some of my favourite smart home devices that I use in my house. When I use them, I really do feel like I'm living in the future, and my partner also absolutely loves them. They're essentially a 4-inch Android tablet that you can run from mains electricity, and they fit perfectly into a large UK back box. With a little bit of effort, you can set them up to display fully interactive smart home dashboards, letting you control anything in your home that's connected to your home assistant. They're made by a company called Tuya, and are known as the T6E Control Panel. The T6E is designed for the European market, and there's also an S6E available which comes with two inbuilt relays, like a smart switch, which is designed for the Asian market. When I moved into my new house, there were some of these ugly wall lights mounted to the bedroom walls, with some two-way switches next to them presumably to be used as a bedside lamp. I didn't like the look of them at all, and I immediately asked the electricians to remove them as soon as I moved in. This of course left a big hole in the wall beside the bed, with some electrical cables hanging out of it, and that turned out to be the perfect place to mount some of these wall panels. Unfortunately, these Tuya panels usually need you to run the Tuya app, or the one from whatever company you've bought them from. But I really wanted to use these panels to run special Home Assistant dashboards that I could easily customise and iterate on. Thankfully, a clever chap called Blackadder has figured out a way to route these devices in a way that lets you run all sorts of apps, including one called Fully Kiosk Browser, which lets me load up Home Assistant dashboards. I've then gone and created some specially designed dashboards which display on these panels, and from here I can control my lights, blinds, heating and air conditioning, and media. I've got one on either side of the bed, and another one in my kitchen which has some special buttons that activate scenes for cooking and when we're eating dinner. Anything that you can do in Home Assistant, you can do from one of these wall panels, and you're only limited by your imagination. In this video, I'm going to show you how you too can route one of these T6 devices to get your very own mains powered smart home control panel. But before we get started, it's worth noting that there are some risks to this. Firstly, you're almost definitely going to be voiding your warranty by doing this. And secondly, this panel is running an older version of Android, and I doubt that it will ever be updated and get any new security patches applied, so it probably won't be supported or work forever. If you want something with longer term support that's open source, I'd strongly suggest looking at a project called OpenHasp. I personally don't like the look of those dashboards, I much prefer to have the Home Assistant Lovelace dashboards available to me, which is what you get from these wall panels. I was able to get the wall panels rooted and up and running, showing my Home Assistant dashboards in about half an hour. This is quite an advanced tutorial, but it's not as complicated as it looks from the outside. This video is going to move quite quickly, but I really wanted to show you the end-to-end -end process of how I got these wall panels up and running to create the opening sequence of this video. As usual, I've put together an article on my Home Automation Guy website that shows you the step-by-step -step instructions and all the commands that you need to type in in order to get this to work. It might look quite scary at first, but hopefully this video will show you that all you need is a bit of courage and to take it slow and you'll be up and running before you know it. I can't take credit for discovering any of the steps in this article or the video. Blackadder did all of the hard work, and I've simply combined three of his blog posts together into this step-by-step -step guide. If you go ahead and follow these steps for yourself, then please go over to Blackadder's website and donate some money to him. He did all of the work, he deserves all of the credit. You can find my article and the original posts from Blackadder all linked in the description below. I recommend using a ZemiSmart T6E panel for this, and those are the ones that I'm actually using next to my bed. The ones that I'm setting up today is a generic Tuya S6E, which I got from AliExpress, and which has these two relays built into it as well. There's a whole range of devices that these instructions will work with, and you can find a list of supported devices and links as to where to buy them from on Blackadder's website, which I've also linked in the description below. As well as your device, you're going to need a USB cable, a Windows computer, and some screwdrivers. Some of the Phillips head screws are really small, so make sure you have at least one teeny tiny screwdriver handy as well. Start by pulling the device out of the box and separating the front panel from the power unit. You can easily pry it off with a flathead screwdriver. You can put the power unit away, as we're not going to be using that for a while. 
On some models like this S6E that I have here, you'll need to pull off some sticky backed tape to expose all of the screws. Then you can go ahead and unscrew all of the Phillips head screw, making sure that you don't lose any of them. Once all the screws are out, you should be able to snap off the back plate using a flathead screwdriver and expose the circuit board underneath. You should be able to see the silver USB port at the bottom, and in order to access it, we'll need to remove the ribbon cable in the bottom right hand side of the board. To remove it, flip up the plastic hinge that is holding the ribbon cable in place and it should come away freely without any friction. Be careful with this, it's the cable that connects the touch interface to the circuit board and if you break or damage it, you won't be able to use the touch screen on the panel. Now you can gently pry up the circuit board and you can plug in your USB cable. Plug the other end of your USB cable into your PC and you should see the panel booting up. Once it's fully booted, you can put the panel down. You'll need to now install the Google USB drivers onto your computer so that the panel is detected by your operating system and the Android platform tools, which is what you're going to be used to interact with your panel and install all of the apps we'll need. Links to these and some instructions are on the Home Automation Guy website that I mentioned earlier. And once they're installed, you should be able to see the panel discovered in the device manager of your computer. It comes up as a PX30 EVB device. Once your device is detected, open up a command prompt window on your computer and navigate to the directory that you installed the platform tools into. I installed mine into C platform tools. The command we're going to be using the most is called ADB, which stands for Android Debug Bridge, and lets you remotely control your Android tablet from the command line. If we run the ADB devices L command, you should see your panel come up and connected like this. At this point, you'll need to just start downloading files and copying and pasting commands from my article into this terminal. The article explains what each file does and what each command does. These commands will disable the Tuya software that comes pre-installed on the panel, installs a generic application launcher so you can load up any Android app that you want, and installs some required Android apps and WebView components so that you can run modern applications on the underlying Android 8.1 operating system. I'm also installing the Fully Kiosk Browser, which is an Android application designed to run websites in full screen on tablets, TVs, and wall panels, so it's perfect for showing Home Assistant dashboards on these types of devices. Once you've downloaded and installed all of the apps and commands using ADB, it's time to put the device back together. Remove the USB cable and carefully put the touchscreen control ribbon back into its slot and close the hinge. Now make sure that this little bit at the top is properly pushed forward. This is the proximity sensor and has a habit of coming out of its hole. Then pop the plastic backing cover back onto the device and put all the little Phillips head screws back in. Finally, make sure that the front cover clips back into the power unit properly and you're good to go and install it in whatever switch hole you're going to eventually use it at. For testing, I put mine into my lighting test rig, which lets me make sure that everything is working properly before I mount it into its final position. It wires in like any normal light switch, with a live and a neutral wire going into the back of the power unit. You can see that my S6E has an L1 and L2 relays available for switching on and off the lights like a smart switch, but the T6E won't have any of these. Once it's wired up, you can secure it into the back box like any other light switch and reattach the faceplate. When you power it up, it should boot up like before and load up into the application launcher. If your touchscreen isn't working here, it's because you either forgot to attach the ribbon cable we removed or you did it incorrectly. If that happens, you'll need to reopen the unit and make sure it's correctly attached. The first thing we want to do once the device is booted up is go into the settings and connect the device to your Wi-Fi network. You do this the same way as you would when you join a new Android phone or tablet to your network. Now you'll notice one of the annoying things about this panel. There are no back or home buttons available, so it's really difficult to navigate around. Luckily, you can remotely connect to the panel using the ADB software we used earlier using its IP address. 
To do that, fire up the command prompt again and navigate to the directory where you installed the ADB tools. Then run the ADB connect command with the IP address that the wall panel has been given by your Wi-Fi router or DHCP server. Now you can send key press commands to the device using the ADB shell input key event command. And once again, I've listed these out on the Home Automation Guy website. You can send back, home and reboot commands directly to the device via this remote connection. You'll need to send the home command to it now so that you can get out of the settings screen and back to the launcher so that you can continue on with the rest of the configuration. You'll need to run these commands every time you need to exit out of an app and go back to the home screen. Don't worry, you really only need to do this during the setup phase and you don't need to do it once it's all configured and you're using it day to day. To start with, we're going to open up the exposed installer and check that you can see a green tick to show that it's activated. Then open up the menu in the top left to go to the module screen. Then check the box next to the any web view item and then reboot the device using the ADB reboot command I mentioned earlier. Once it's booted up, we can go back into the settings area, then to the system menu and to the about screen. You need to scroll right down to the bottom and tap the build number screen seven times, which activates developer mode. You can now go back a level and you should see that a new developer options menu items appeared. Open that up and scroll down to the web view implementation option and open that up. We now want to toggle on the new WebView version that we installed previously, the one with the highest version number, which is what you need turned on in order to make modern apps like Home Assistant work properly. Congratulations, you've now done most of the setup you need to get Home Assistant working on this panel. I highly recommend creating a separate Home Assistant user account that the wall panel will use to log in and access Home Assistant. To do this, open up Home Assistant on your computer and go to the settings area then to people and click users at the top. Click the add user button and you'll be shown in the screen to add a new user account. Create a new user account, set the password and be sure to turn on the option that only lets this user log in from the local network. Now send the home key command to the tablet to take it back to the launcher and then open the fully kiosk browser that we installed before. The first time you load it up, you'll see a setup screen. And what we want to do here is type in the address to your Home Assistant server into the start URL box. If you've got a specific dashboard that you want to show on the panel, then type in the full URL to that dashboard into the box so that it loads up to the correct Lovelace screen each time. You should see the familiar Home Assistant login screen now, and here we'll enter the username and the password for the special user account we created before. Just make sure to tick the box that says keep me logged in so that you don't need to type this in every time the panel boots. If everything worked correctly, you should now see the Home Assistant dashboard loaded up on the screen. You might need to do some tweaking on the dashboard to make it work well on this small four inch touchscreen, but the screen is really responsive. And if you make the buttons big enough, they're really actually easy to use. Small sliders and thermostats are not so easy to interact with but the improvements that the Home Assistant team have made on the tile cards are absolutely perfect for this use case. To get to the Fully Kiosk Browser settings page, you can swipe in from the left hand side. In here, you can change the start URL, making it load up your special dashboard if you haven't already done so. I would also recommend turning on the setting to load up fully kiosk when the panel starts. That way, if the power goes out for any reason and comes back on again, the panel will automatically load directly into the Home Assistant dashboard that you want. You can find this settings in the device management area of the fully kiosk browser settings page. You now have a wall panel device that you can use to control anything in your house that you have connected into Home Assistant. With all the settings configured how they are at the moment, your wall panel will just stay on all the time. This can be quite annoying as it will light up a dark room and also waste a lot of power. The device uses about one and a half watts of power when the screen is on compared to less than a watt if the screen is off. 
the S6E and the T6E have a proximity sensor at the top of the screen that detects if a hand or a person is in front of it, and that can be used to wake up the screen when someone is in front of the panel. To make this work, we need to install a little bit more software to the panel using the ADB commands. Make sure you're connected to the panel with the ADP connect command that we used earlier, and then download the Automagic application and a script. Automagic is an Android application that you can use to create automations on the device, similar to a Home Assistant automation or an if this then that routine. Once again, this is all thanks to Blackadder's great instructions, which I've referenced on my Home Automation Guy article. When Automagic is installed, go back to the home screen and open up the app. Skip through the terms and conditions, the tutorial, and I found it easiest to delete all of the existing flows that come pre-installed. You can do that by clicking the kebab menu in the top right and deleting them one by one. Once you've got a blank slate here, you can go into the top left menu and go to the import flows and widgets option. Navigate to the downloads folder and you should see the script that you copied in there earlier. Click on the XML file to import it. This flow will turn the screen on when the proximity sensor detects an object within a certain range. You can edit it with the pencil icon and you may want to adjust the distance value so that the screen turns on when you stand in front of it or place your hand in front of it. As you move your hand around in front of the screen, you should see the current value changing. Make a note of the value when you have your hand in the place that you want the screen to turn on and adjust the distance to be just lower than that value. I find that 300 works well in my house. When you've made your changes and saved your workflow, make sure to turn it on by using the little toggle at the top. You can now test it by moving your hand in front of it again and it should go red when the script is activated. We now need to make some changes to the Android settings to make the device turn off the screen after 30 seconds of inactivity. This is in the display menu under advanced and then sleep. I found that 30 seconds works best for me. In some cases, the device wouldn't go to sleep at all if I chose a smaller value like 15 seconds. No idea why. Now go back to Fully Kiosk, swipe in from the left hand side, and then to Settings and Device Management. Here you need to turn off the Keep Screen On option. And now you're done. Your wall panel should now turn its screen off after 30 seconds of inactivity and turn itself back on again when you move your hand in front of it. It wasn't that hard, was it? Sure, there are a lot of steps involved, but they're not that complicated if you followed these specific instructions. And I definitely think it's worth putting in the effort. These things are just so cool. They really level up your smart home game and feel very futuristic. If you make your Home Assistant dashboards clear enough, they can be easily used and understood by your family members and by any guests visiting your home. The best part is that they're mains powered, they fit into a normal light switch back box and you can constantly tweak and change your Home Assistant dashboards on your computer and they'll be immediately updated on your wall panel without you having to do any extra configuration. Do you think you'll be using something like this in your own smart home? What kind of dashboards and automations would you create with this? Let me know in the comments below. I love hearing about what you guys are up to in your own smart homes. And whilst you're down there, please hit the subscribe button and like the video. It really helps me understand if I'm creating things that are useful to you all. By subscribing to the channel, you'll get to know when I've uploaded a new video. And then together, we can make your home smarter.